Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Abner, and I'm the technology consultant here at the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. Although when I say here, I'm not really in the building. This is my first ever webinar being presented from my home in South Frankfurt. So still coming to you from the beautiful Frankfurt area. Um, but just bear with us, folks. Uh, this is you know, kind of a first, and I think the setup is good, but we might have some issues. Could be my mic, could be noise in the background. Honestly, the biggest possibility is my cats. I really think my cats might uh, try to interrupt. I've got one who really loves technology, but is not the brightest kitty cat of all time. So we'll see what happens. And I'm very excited to be here with you today because most of the time I'm presenting about the E-Rate program. Um, I'm the person who probably terrorizes one of your coworkers who really hates the E-Rate program and looks stressed about it. It's because of me. Uh, but today I get to talk about uh, a different technology topic, talking about privacy, and I'm very excited that there are so many different names um, in the webinar today, in the chat pod. Uh, so hopefully um, you'll get accustomed to my weirdness uh, pretty quickly, um, since maybe you've not had a presentation with me before, uh, but I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say in the chat. All right, so. I tend to overpack my presentations. I, I'm always very ambitious about the amount of content I can realistically cover. So we're going to talk first about the general privacy landscape, um, some laws that have come into effect, sort of that legal landscape, talk about some current events that are impacting privacy, and then we'll shift more into how this specifically affects uh, the library community. And there are some slides that are pretty text heavy, have links or references. So some of those I may only hit briefly just for the sake of time so that maybe we can have a little more discussion at the end. Uh, so I do apologize about the brisk pace, uh, but please, you know, with those slides that you can download at the end of the presentation, you can go back and check some of the references uh, later if needed. So why did I want to do this presentation? I have had privacy and public libraries on my mind for a while, and this was really the first opportunity I've had to send this presentation out into you know, the broader community. I did a little test run back in August with um, some librarians who attended KDLA's Public Library Institute, and it went over pretty well. Uh, again, too much content. I've tried to trim it a little bit, but otherwise, I think library uh, library staff, uh, like librarians, IT people, were all ready to talk about this. And it just seemed like in the news, um, I just kept reading about so many things that were really raising concerns and kind of caused me to think about what we, um, as library staff, are doing. Um, are we just sort of, you know? not thinking about privacy or deciding that we like the convenience of certain services over the fact that maybe it's a privacy problem. And I think it's something that we should really talk about. And I want to make sure that you understand that for this presentation, I am not coming at you from some ivory tower where I am just this paragon of privacy and I practice everything correctly and I'm here to you know, preach at you and, and tell you exactly what you need to do. I'm very much someone who enjoys a lot of library services and clicks OK on a lot of agreements, you know, on websites without really thinking about it. I definitely make my own compromises, but I am trying to be better. So this is more about starting the discussion. It's, it's not about, you know, lecturing at you or waggling my finger. Okay, so first let's talk about a few laws that have come into effect that, in some cases, impact Kentucky libraries more directly or the world at large, more about you know, larger corporations. So some of you may be familiar with um, the Kentucky Revised Statutes, Section 61.931 uh, governs the um, personal information security and breach investigations. Um, as far as how different government entities need to handle um, personal, uh, personally identifiable information 
for um, their agency and the customers that they serve, and that if there's some kind of breach where um, personally identifiable information is exposed, uh, the procedure that has to be followed to investigate that and notify the public if needed. That went into effect um, in January 2015. So public libraries as special purpose government entities or SPGs um, have adopted certain policies. And also they have to make sure now that when you know, we're dealing with vendors that may have access to some kind of uh, personally identifiable information, that those vendors are willing to follow the regulations that are as le at least as strict as those in Kentucky. They may have even more stringent standards they're following, but they do have to meet you know, the certain obligations under uh, the Kentucky Revised Statutes. So this impacts libraries because we have certain information that we may be gathering about our patrons, but you know, more importantly for you guys, um, you know, your library has a lot of information about you that is personally identifiable. So just the staff information about employment and health insurance and things like that. So when we're combining things like the account number, you know, a social security number, driver's license number, uh, things like that, depending on what you're gathering, that combination of items and, you know, how it's being stored. Uh, you still have to be really, really careful with that information and make sure that you're following certain procedures, um, you know, in the event that, you know, something happens and your system is compromised or, you know, the information is accidentally sent to <laughs> you know, the wrong group of people. There are so many ways that this can happen. We have information on the KDLA website. If you don't, if you're not as familiar with, um, you know, your library's information security policy, we have, you know, a checklist to help you follow those procedures if something occurs. There's also um, support that, you know, we can have access to through the Commonwealth Office of Technology. That's the group that provides IT support for state government. Uh, but they're also really the agency involved uh, when there are any kind of breach investigations for state government or local government, including libraries. So we can certainly help out if that occurs. Now, taking a broader view, uh, one of the biggest laws that has really shaken up the privacy landscape is from the European Union, the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, that went into effect almost two years ago. And that law gives uh, EU citizens a lot of control about the data that is collected um, by various companies and uh, gives them the right to have a lot of that information deleted, the right to be forgotten. And because we're talking about so many citizens and um, you know, it affects businesses that um, you know, work in Europe or store information about European Union citizens, it effectively has caused changes all around the globe because there's not a good way for companies like Google and Facebook and Apple and all of these multinational companies to have just a very strict set of um, procedures or regulations that they're only following for one particular geographic sector. It really has spread throughout all of their operations because that's really about the only fe feasible way to do it. So we have seen in the wake of this being passed um, that other areas of the world are now paying more attention to privacy regulations and passing some of their own, especially because uh, this isn't just a set of guidelines, it also comes with um, some financial pen penalties. It can be up to 4% of a company's um, annual turnover. So it can be quite expensive if a company is mishandling uh, the data of EU citizens. So in the wake of GDPR, um, California has passed its own law that's somewhat similar and in some ways um, a little bit harder for companies to follow. And because California is what the sixth largest economy in the world, uh, what California does ends up impacting the entire globe. So it's not just this one state, it affects really the rest of the United States and obviously all these country, uh, companies that operate both in California and many other countries around the world. So this just went into effect on January 1st, 2020. 
got a link there to a, uh, a website that talks more in depth about you know, what this law does and, and uh, who was impacted by it. Um, but it's pretty similar in the idea of you know, needing to comply to delete information about California citizens, uh, the concept of data portability, basically being able to take your information, have it exported, and take it somewhere else if needed. Uh, let's see. And then, of course, it has uh, some penalties as well. Um, it really impacts companies that have a certain level of business in California. But again, we're seeing the ripple effects of this law, even if you know, Kentucky Public Libraries aren't having to comply with it. You're probably dealing with a company that in some way is having to comply with um, this particular law in California. And of course, um, there are other states that have started focusing on breach notifications and, and other uh, regulations related to privacy. So I won't go through the list there, but just in the past couple of years, we've seen many states starting to pay attention to that and also starting to pay more attention to companies that um, handle data. So in Vermont, for example, um, they've begun regulating data brokers where they might be culling information from various sources and repackaging it to sell. And we're going to talk about an example of a company that is doing that with the library community. Um, so, you know, there are just a lot of effects that we're seeing because of um, these major laws that have passed. Okay. So past the legal part, which honestly <laughs> makes me a little bit more nervous to talk about. I feel like there are so many provisos I can't describe it well. But gosh darn, there's a lot to say about current events relating to privacy. Um, and I think these are probably stories that you've all heard about. And honestly, we could have just a solid hour of you know, talking about, for example, Facebook. So a lot of folks started paying uh, more attention to Facebook, really giving scrutiny uh, to their services and, and how they were relying on Facebook and giving too much information in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So this was really first report, reported back in December 2015 that a British uh, consulting firm was gathering all this information from Facebook profiles uh, without consent of those users and then was using that information in aiding certain uh, U.S. political campaigns. And so that was reported, but you know, really didn't take off. People didn't seem to notice or care. And then it kind of gained a lot more momentum in March 2018 when a whistleblower came, came forward and revealed that the accounts of 50 million Americans have been compromised by Cambridge Analytica. And so last summer, um, the largest ever fine levied by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, uh, that was levied against Facebook, so $5 billion for deceiving users about uh, their privacy and how Facebook uses their data. Um, and they've been fined by other groups as well. So I think this was a pretty big wake-up call for folks that, hey, these uh, things that you're posting on social media, that to you seem private, maybe you even think you've got it limited to just your friends and family. That doesn't mean there's not some company in the background who's getting access to your information and potentially trying to use that against you, trying to use that to uh, manipulate you. And you weren't informed that that was going to happen. Nobody asked for your consent. And that, I think, really disturbed a lot of folks. We've also seen lots of big news about location tracking. So a couple of summers ago, basically all the major cell phone carriers um, you know, were forced to stop selling their information to these third-party vendors, these data brokers, who were then turning around and selling the location data, in this case real-time location data, to law enforcement. So instead of having to get a warrant to get access to someone's information, uh, these law enforcement agencies could turn to a company like Securus Technology and basically sidestep the legal process, which obviously is very disturbing that we have this particular procedure in place for how law enforcement um, is able to get this very you know, personal information. I mean, your cell phone knows lots and lots about you, obviously, everywhere you've gone, you know, people you've been in contact with. 
So the idea in real time that law enforcement can track you down and they don't even have to have a warrant uh, to do that, uh, I mean, that is just a, it's a major violation for many people. So, you know, luckily that has been stopped, or at least the companies have said they're going to stop. Um, but now there are some concerns being raised again because uh, with COVID-19, uh, Google and Apple are working on a system that's voluntary for contact tracing. So it would use uh, Bluetooth to figure out people you've been in contact with so that if you test positive and you have opted into various health apps that would use their system, uh, they would be able to say, okay, you went to this grocery store, you went to this doctor's office, you were at a friend's house. If the, it would recognize you know, where you had been and therefore the people who could have been exposed to COVID-19 because you had it within a certain time period, which is an incredible advance for trying to um, you know, deal with the pandemic. And there are supposed to be privacy measures in place so that your information isn't identifiable. Um, but we hear again and again that information that is allegedly private, that has been somehow made anonymous, is not really as anonymous as it seems. That when so many data points are being collected about you, there's still a pretty good chance that a very detailed portrait uh, can be drawn of your life and can be connected to you because there are just too many pieces of data that ultimately funnel down to one likely person. And then all of those lovely internet connected devices. There was a point last summer, uh, last spring and summer, where I felt like every time I looked at the news, it was something else about um, all of these internet enabled speakers, you know, home devices like Alexa and Siri and you know, Google Assistant. Something was always happening where we heard that uh, the device had been recording someone without their consent and that the information, the recording had been sent to contractors. In some cases, the information was accidentally sent to some other user of the same service that in no way, in no way related to the person who'd been recorded. And uh, you know, a lot of very personal information, um, you know, very personal moments got recorded in this way. So just all last year, it was just apology after apology for all of these privacy lapses and for uh, using this information without, again, telling people that, you know, if you agree to use this device, you know, we might be sending, you know, this information halfway across the world to contractors who are going to listen to your personal information in an effort to make the service better. So we've seen these services have to change their practices, make things opt in, or you know, stop collecting information that way because there's been such an outcry over the use of personal information. Uh, interesting report, um, interesting and very sad, uh, from the UK. Uh, their Children's Commissioner published um, in November 2018 a report called Who Knows What About Me? And I thought this was pretty shocking, um, the information that, or the amount of data that is collected about children uh, who don't really have control about, um, you know, what's being shared about their lives online before they're an adult. So in this report, uh, it estimated that by the age of 13, parents will have upload an estimated 1,300 photos and videos of their child. And then uh, by the age of 18, there are going to be 70,000 posts about these children. So some of them may be posts that they've made, but that could be, you know, mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, you know, posting about a child without their consent. And you've got this huge digital footprint for all this information about the child. So you're talking about your electronic medical records and all your electronic school records and all these social media accounts. So that effectively for you know, young children growing up now, the concept of privacy is practically non-existent. And I didn't have room to get into it in this presentation, but I think we've all seen some of those articles about you know, a child who has objected to you know, a, a mommy blogger, although I hate that term, <laughs> feels a little bit sexist, but, you know, you've got some parent who is trying to make a living about, you know, blogging or, or 
vlogging, vlogging, whatever you call it, making videos about you know their their parenting experience, and understandably they talk about their child, show images of their child, and the child doesn't necessarily have a say in that. And we're starting to see a pushback, you know, where children are saying like, "Hey, just because I'm a child doesn't mean that I don't have rights. It doesn't mean that I don't deserve privacy. And how dare you post all of this embarrassing information about me?" Uh, so I think. You know, the Generation Z and whatever comes after Generation Z, I think we're going to see, you know, a shift in the way youth are approaching privacy because, you know, they're, they're realizing as they're getting closer to adulthood that, wait a second, you know, we didn't get to talk about all this stuff getting posted about us. We didn't have a choice in that matter, unlike our parents or, you know, our grandparents. And maybe children should have more of a say. Maybe we should just as a culture decide not to post so much about children. So having discussed some of the legal issues and some of the, the current events, um, it feels like in some ways, even though we've had these massive law changes um, and we've had all of these scandals and there's been outrage for a little while, you know, has much really changed? Um, do people stop using certain products or services? Do they really change their habits or their practices? And it kind of feels like not. So it sort of uh, raises the question, does privacy really matter if we don't treat it uh, like it matters? And I think you know that my answer will be that, yes, I still think it matters, even if we're not necessarily doing a great job. So I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about why I think it matters. Because there are so many consequences when you don't have privacy. So uh, one of the first that comes to mind is just social consequences. So if your personal information that you thought was being shared in a small group suddenly is exposed to a much larger group, uh, then yeah, you can end up having just uh, feelings of shame um, because your information was out there in a way that you didn't intend. And it can be pretty intense. I don't know if you have read the book um, So You've Been Publicly Shamed by John Ronson. Uh, that's a pretty interesting, pretty short book, fast read, uh, talking about how various people have um, you know, dealt with some sort of public shaming online when people um, kind of dogpile. Um, you know, talking about celebrities who've had nude photo scandals, things like that. Um, but for some people, it's just a tremendous mental um, impact, you know, really causes psychological problems. So it's not just some abstract thing. It's not just about turning off your computer. It can really impact your, your real life, you know, away from the Internet. And then there are obvious financial consequences. You know, it may be pretty direct if what you think is your private banking information somehow gets exposed in a data breach, well, you know, someone may steal your information and just start spending your money or, you know, running up, um, you know, a credit card and you're suddenly on the hook for that. Um, or it could be that if, you know, something you thought was private, maybe you said something inflammatory and people find out, uh, then perhaps you lose your job. So there can be some very uh, specific direct financial consequences for the loss of privacy. And then, of course, depending on where you are in the world, there may be some very intense political consequences. So we think about um, you know, artists and activists in China who've spoken out against the government and have been imprisoned. Or we hear about people who just disappear. We assume that they have been killed uh, for speaking out. Uh, so if they think they're using a secure and private form of communication and it's not really secure and private, uh, then perhaps you know, that's going to have an impact on their basic liberty or it could mean their death in some cases. And one that bothers me um, that maybe we don't always think about as much is the concept of self-censorship. So the image of God here is uh, the Panopticon, which was commissioned by Jeremy Bentham, and the drawing was made by Willie Reveille in the late 1800s. So the concept of the Panopticon is that prisoners will end up really policing themselves because they don't know at any given time if they're being watched. 
you really only need one person in a central watchtower. Um, and if that's darkened and you can't see where that guard is turned at any given moment, you effectively have to behave as though at any time you really are being watched. So you end up curtailing your own free expression out of fear of being watched, even though at that moment maybe you're not. And so I think that's something that I know that I've done. You know, I worry sometimes, if what if somebody found out about my weird Google searches? You know, what if somebody, you know, found out about all these goofy habits of mine? Um, you know, do I really want to, you know, somehow be caught out for, you know, watching something weird online or making some sort of statement online that I shouldn't have? So you end up sort of, you know, stifling your own creativity or, you know, your, what are we going to call it? You know, your intellectual impulse to, to really dive into a subject. Uh, especially if it's something that's more controversial. You might think about somebody who would want to research about, you know, politically touchy topics or maybe just, you know, sexuality. There are people who may not feel comfortable in, you know, researching that topic because what if their family found out? Uh, you know, what if somebody in the community found out and there were some sort of consequences to that? So I think even though it's not as direct as, say, going to prison or losing your job, I think self-censorship can really have a deep impact on individuals and on society. And also important to think about with privacy is that even if you don't really think that you have much to hide, you know, you're an open book. Who cares? I'm not doing anything wrong. They can track my data. They can see my Google searches. I have no sense of shame. I've done nothing wrong. Um, you may think that now, but uh, you don't always know right away that you have something that perhaps should have stayed private. You know, a couple examples that came to mind for this would be, you know, our, our treatment of people who had communist sympathies or were friends with com communists in the you know late 1930s, 1940s. That was perfectly acceptable. The communists were our allies against the Axis powers during World War II, but by the 1950s. We had McCarthyism. We were prosecuting people who proclaimed to be communists or had those kind of sympathies. People were encouraged to uh, report on their friends to the House on American Activities uh, Committee. So at that time, you know, something that you didn't feel like you had to hide, you know, having your, your communist friend Sally, um, all of a sudden, a decade later, it ends up being, you know, a real problem, something that could see you get imprisoned. Uh, or you could see your friend Sally go to prison. So you don't know that that's going to happen. Uh, more recently, there are countries where, you know, the laws have changed and it's not been progressive. We've seen, you know, countries take a step back on uh, rights for the gay community. So in Russia, for example, somebody who may have felt pretty comfortable, you know, discussing uh, their sexuality online, uh, suddenly that information um, is out there in a way that maybe they don't have control over and now that's being used against them because the laws of their country have changed. So it's not that you're necessarily doing anything wrong, it's just that you don't know that the landscape in which you're sharing things now is going to be the same, you know, a decade from now, you know, two decades from now. So now that we've talked a little bit about uh, the general privacy landscape want to shift focus to how that pertains to the library community. So this uh, next part is a little bit text heavy, so I'm going to try not to read every single word on every single slide because I know that can be tedious, but I did want to get some into our professional background. So the American Library Association is the, the largest, oldest professional organization related to librarianship. And they have really helped to codify um, you know, all sorts of concepts about librarianship. And there are two very important documents that really outline um, our rights and our responsibilities as librarians and the, the rights and, and responsibilities that our patrons have as well. So that would be the Library Bill of Rights and also the uh, Code of Ethics. So in these two documents, I think we see a lot of, about the concept of privacy and also the concept of intellectual freedom and how those two concepts are intertwined. So from ALA, 
just very briefly, the definition of intellectual freedom. Uh, those are the rights of library users to read, seek information, and speak freely as guaranteed by the First Amendment. And so when we look at some of the points in these two documents and also in the later interpretations of these documents, uh, we see that you can't really have intellectual freedom without privacy. Um, so you have a very negative impact on privacy when there's uh, a lack of you know, intellectual freedom. So it just kind of goes back and forth. Okay, so first up, the Code of Ethics. Uh, this was originally uh, passed in 1939 and was most recently amended in 2008. So this outlines just our various ethical responsibilities. And I wanted to highlight just a few uh, that really relate to privacy and intellectual freedom. So point number two, uh, we uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and resist all efforts to censor library resources. So I would hazard a, gu hazard a guess that many of you in this webinar today um, have a master's in library science or have taken some classes toward that, or at the very least, um, you know, you became interested in working in the library community even if you're not directly a librarian. So probably you're fairly familiar with discussions or debates about uh, censorship. I remember in all the foundation courses it seemed like no matter what the course was, even if it was something related to cataloging, it always came back to some debate about censorship. Um, and I sort of thought, oh, gosh, do we really need to have this discussion again? Uh, but apparently we did. I remember there were some folks who um, seemed pretty pro-censorship, kind of a curious stance for a librarian, um, especially when you read this code of ethics. But um, you know, it's here in black and white. I think there, there's not a lot of wiggle room on this particular point. And then point three, we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. Uh, so that's also, I think, a very clear statement. Um, in Kentucky, I can't remember the number of the Kentucky Revised Statute, but you know, patron records, you know, your borrowing history, that's not something that's just subject to an open records request. Uh, you know, law enforcement can get access to, you know, some information, but in general, um, you know, we see in law and in our code of ethics here that um, the information about you know, what you've sought from your library, uh, the books that you've borrowed, the information you've consulted, just that information in and of itself is considered private, which I love. And then point six, this is one we'll come back to in a little bit. Point six, we do not advance private interests at the expense of library users, colleagues, or our employing institutions. So this maybe doesn't immediately sound like it pertains to privacy, but I think it really comes into play when we think about uh, the various third party services that libraries use. and the idea that perhaps we're buying into these services and ignoring some of our other responsibilities just because it's convenient. So I definitely think this is pretty important. Then on to the Library Bill of Rights, also originally passed in 1939 and most recently amended last year. So this expands on the importance of avoiding censorship in providing library services. So just a few brief points. Article 3 of the Library Bill of Rights, libraries should challenge censorship in the fulfillment of the responsibility to provide information and enlightenment. And then point four, libraries should cooperate with all persons and groups concerned with resisting abridgment of free expression and free access to ideas. So not just I like that in this Library Bill of Rights, it's not just about what do we do, it's about taking an active role as an advocate to ensure free exp expression for our patrons. So it's very much giving um, you know, us a stance of um, you know, not being passive, we're going to be very active in our support of these concepts. And we're going to work with other groups to make sure that those concepts are advanced. And then in addition to the Library Bill of Rights, there are several uh, documents that have come along to provide further interpretation. So I highly recommend that you take uh, a moment at some point and read 
privacy and interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights. So it comes right out with the, the opening statement, privacy is essential to the exercise of free speech, free thought, and free association. So, I mean, that's pretty much in a nutshell what I wanted to say, but uh, just in case, uh, using some internet speak, too long, didn't read, TLDR, uh, that basically when we look at these documents, we see that patrons should have an expectation that library services are going to be provided to them without censorship and that we're not going to violate their privacy uh, in the course of providing services to them. And that basically when libraries engage in censorship or when they you know, are advancing private interests over the interests of their patrons, then we are curtailing their freedom. We're curtailing their access to information and we're curtailing their ability to express their opinions freely. So yeah. Okay, so we've talked a bit about our ethical responsibilities. Uh, so now let's talk about potentially how the library community is maybe failing on that a little bit. Um, so this next section I've entitled The Questionable Privacy of Digital Library Services. So I think you can see where I'm maybe coming down on this, despite being an avid user myself. So in the past um, you know, 10, 15 years, we've certainly seen you know, the rise of all these third-party services that we're using to del deliver products to our patrons digitally. And right now, business is booming. I mean, we are so glad to have these services since, you know, we can't physically go to the building during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, and I have used, at some point, every single one of the services on the screen there. And this is just a sampling. There are so many more. This is a huge part of the, the library ecosystem. Um, are these third-party services, but they don't come, you know, without certain drawbacks when we consider what we said our, our ethical responsibilities were in those foundational documents from the American Library Association. So I just wanted to uh, briefly touch on a few things that have happened that kind of brings into question about, you know, why are we in business with some of these companies and do we sort of give token outrage when something occurs, but we don't really take much of a stance. Uh, there's sort of a mixed history there of libraries really kind of uh, drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is too far, you know, like, no more. Uh, so one of the bigger uh, instances of this is Adobe Digital Editions. So back in 2014, uh, the desktop or laptop version of Adobe Digital Editions 4.0 uh, was discovered to be sending lots and lots of unencrypted information about library patrons and their reading habits, and it was just getting posted in plain text on a server. So a lot of it, um, you could take that information and piece it together and really learn a lot about an individual person's reading habits and potentially even identify uh, the person if you really took a good look at the information. Uh, so. The American Library Association through their, um, let's see, what was it, the Digital Content Working Group. Um, you know, they came out strong and said, you know, this is outrageous, you know, that we cannot stand for this, that, you know, this needs to be fixed right away. There's no reason to be doing this. And, you know, Adobe came out and, you know, they added encryption and they said they'd fix the problem. But that doesn't mean that there's not still a lot of information, you know, being transmitted about patrons. Uh, use of ebooks through the service. Uh, I do want to point out that this really affected just the desktop version of this app. This wasn't, um, you know, this is, doesn't directly relate to borrowing ebooks from from OverDrive. Um, but basically, Adobe said, ah, you know, this is within our privacy policy. You know, we said, you know, we could do this. Um, and so, as long as they said it in the policy and people just agreed, it's not really a problem, essentially. Um, but really. There's not any reason that Adobe needs to collect all of this patron information, this readership information, you know, where you started and stopped in books. You don't have to gather that and then take all that data and export it and store it and do other things with it later. They don't need to do that in order to provide the service that libraries are providing. They're just doing it because they can and probably because that information is somehow useful in some other monetary way to them. Uh, down the line. And as far as I could tell, you know, after the app was updated, 
you know, and people have had their say. We just sort of went back to business as usual. Did we stop using this? No, no. I mean, it's still just out there. And, you know, there doesn't seem to have been much in the way of consequences for this. More recently, uh, Canopy, which is a video streaming service, has uh, kind of the indie titles, lots of classics. You know, I've used that through my local library. And they had a, a data breach last year. I ended up getting an email about that um, where some of the user's IP addresses and some of their viewing activity ended up being, um, you know, posted on a website. It was exposed up there unencrypted, you know, for people to find. And uh, Canopy claimed at the time that it was just a very small number of users, you know, 162 um, users, you know, were affected by this. Um, but then, you know, security researchers said, well, no, there seems to be a lot more data than that. And there's also a lot of very specific information. You could really dig down into the data and find out, you know, where somebody was and what they were watching and, you know, just it really paints a more specific and kind of creepy picture of, you know, what people were watching. So this, again, sort of just slipped under the radar. I think a lot of people just didn't even hear about it. And I definitely, you know, paused a moment or two before using Canopy again. Um, have I stopped using it? No, because I am a hypocrite and I'm here along with you just wanting to be better about privacy and maybe not doing it much myself. Uh, this one was pretty interesting, also from uh, late last summer, kind of into the fall, uh, with Santa Cruz Public Libraries. So there ended up being a grand jury investigation about their use of a product called Gale Analytics on Demand. And with Gale Analytics on Demand, they take credit information from Experian and all the demographic information from Experian, and then they can sort of combine that with your, your patron database to help you make uh, or create marketing reports. So you say, look at a particular area, you know, where your patrons are living, kind of see, look at the demographics, and maybe that helps you determine, do we need to build a branch there? You know, what kind of services do we need to provide? What's kind of, you know, programming? What sort of hours? Things like that. And, you know, so this grand jury that investigated basically said this was a violation of the library system's own you know, privacy policies and that basically they didn't, you know, ask their patrons about doing this. There's also sort of the concern of, you know, you're taking information that by itself isn't necessarily that revelatory, you know, you've got a name and an address, but then when you start combining it with credit information about your household and who lives there and how much money you make and, um, you know, probably, you know, race, ethnicity, you know, all these other factors, you've taken what was not very specific information and suddenly made it much more personal. And you, know, you didn't tell your patrons you were doing that. You know, I feel kind of violated if I found out that you know, my library were doing something like that about me. I don't know, you know what Experian you know, would necessarily say about me. And my data has been exposed, I think, was it Experian, Equifax, all of them? You know, it seems like everybody's been involved in a breach. Um, but, you know, this, that was a pretty interesting and detailed report from the grand jury investigation. And so the library ended up having to, they had already at that point stopped using the service. Um, but, you know, it was a pretty thorough scolding that they got via this grand jury about their use of that product that maybe they should have thought about more before they paid for it. Now, here's an interesting one. Uh, so back when I did this presentation in August 2019, for um, the Public Library Institute. Um, we were just hearing about uh, the pushback against uh, lynda.com and its rebranding to LinkedIn Learning. Um, so at that time, um, it was in, I think, mid to late June 2019, uh, lynda.com had announced, you know, we're going to rebrand, it's going to be LinkedIn Learning, um, because Microsoft, which owns LinkedIn, had purchased lynda.com. So with this change, instead of being able, as a library patron, to use your library's access to lynda.com and just log in with your, um, your, your barcode and, and your PIN, 
um, you were going to have to create a profile on LinkedIn. And on LinkedIn, there's certain information I think that you can't make fully private. You don't have to have the entire pr profile visible, but you know, at least some of it would be visible, and it may be more difficult for people to opt out. And so that's not what a lot of libraries had signed up for when you know, they started paying for that service. It was very much, we want this to continue being the way it was and the way a lot of our other services are. We do a verification process to make sure there are patrons, but otherwise, you know, we don't need to be tracking exactly what a specific patron is doing. They don't need to create this profile in order to watch some videos on, on uh, you know, lynda.com. Uh, so there was a lot of pushback. And it sort of seemed at the time that, gosh, you know, it's Microsoft, you know, it's this big corporation, and the little libraries are, you know, shaking their fists, stamping their feet, and saying, no more, no more. And I sort of figured this was going to be, you know, a story where eventually people just sort of shrugged their shoulders and moved on. But this is an excellent example of why, you know, advocacy in regards to privacy is important and that the library community um, has a great impact. We can be very strong together when we collectively say that, you know, we're not going to take it anymore, essentially. So just very recently, in the past uh, month or so, uh, LinkedIn Learning has announced that they're not going to um, change how the profiles are handled. So, um, you know, patrons are going to be able to log in with their barcode and their PIN instead of creating a LinkedIn profile. It looks like we've got a question, and here's hoping I can answer it. Maybe not. Uh, all right, so Caleb asks, question about LinkedIn. When is it supposed to go into effect that they will no longer have to create an account? And when logging in via my library subscription, it still asks to set up a profile. Uh, to be honest, I did not read specifically enough to know when that's going into effect. I guess actually I misunderstood and thought it hadn't gone into effect at all. But if you follow that link, actually you can click on it on the screen right now. In that last point for 2020 where it says won't require, um, that links to a library journal um, article on InfoDocket. And then the InfoDocket article links to um, LinkedIn Learning's st statement about this. So that may have the specific information that you are looking for. So I'll have to look into that more. So I just, I'm not prepared to give you the answer, but hopefully we can research it after this and figure that out. Excellent question. Oh gosh, and look at the time. Okay, so I gotta go through this. Actually, you know what, we're doing okay. So I know it's rather deep in the presentation to be asking your opinion now, but I just um, wanted to point out a few services that had kind of caught my attention. Um, do you guys have any services that um, give you privacy concerns, or do you have any big concerns about the way um, that you know all these third-party services, the way your library handles things, uh, does it impact your patrons' privacy? Let's see what people have to say. Everybody sound off. I wish I had some music to play right now. All I can hear is my clock ticking. I don't know if that picks up on the recording. I see that multiple people are typing. This is very suspenseful. OK, I know eventually the comments will come in. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. But we'll stop and, and go back to the comments um, when that's complete. OK, good. I'm glad somebody else. I, I did have the Jeopardy theme in my own head, so very good. So it looks like uh, Melissa mentions, has anybody had any issues with Beanstack? Um, so you guys just purchased that for use in the summer. So Melissa, I may have to contact you afterward. I know there have been, there was one issue that a, a particular library had with Beanstack. It was several years ago, maybe three or four, uh, where accidentally, I think, somebody's information uh, got exposed. It was minor. It wasn't considered, a, you know, a breach that, you know, rose to the level of having to go through that process we talked about for KRS 61.931. Uh, um, hopefully that issue has been addressed, but I can't say more than that, uh, at least not on the webinar. <laughs> okay, so everybody's singing the Jeopardy song. So you can keep, keep typing and I'll move along. Let's see. And of course, Sharon Gray point, everybody's thinking about using Zoom right now, because I know a lot of you have switched to using Zoom 
to do, uh, you know, virtual book clubs, virtual um, story times, things like that. And, you know, right now that seems to what, be what people are using, even though there have been some security you know, risks involved. Okay, and Julie asks, what about gaming platforms for young adults? Any issues? Uh, and then the physical registration cards. A lot of libraries have done away with physical re registration cards. They just directly enter somebody into the system or they immediately shred the physical uh, registration information. Excellent question. Privacy for children. Amanda Wheeler, thank you for bringing that up. It's not necessarily my, you know, I talk about technology issues. I don't really focus on you know, youth services the way our youth services consultant does. But I think privacy for children has been overlooked. I think about that a lot in terms of uh, the Children's Internet Protection Act, which many libraries have to comply with and a lot of schools comply with to get their E-rate funding or to get certain federal funding for internet access or computers. And it seems like people don't care about the intellectual freedom of children, even though there really is a legal basis for that. I would love to do more research, <laughs> maybe someday do a presentation on that. If anybody's really interested in that topic and wants to maybe team up, I'd be interested. Okay, and you want to ask for more on Beanstack. Okay, and then questions about Discord. Okay, it sounds like we're gonna to need to continue some of this uh, conversation later on. So let's talk about <laughs> the time we've got left, just a little bit about, um, you know, we've seen some of the compromises some, some people in the library community have made, maybe all of us are making, uh, but there are things we are doing as librarians to push back and to try to defend uh, patrons' privacy or the concept of privacy more generally. So just run through these quick, quickly. Um, so I was really pleased to see several years ago, I think now it's been probably four or five years ago, um, the DC Public Library uh, did a programming series related to um, 1984, George Orwell's novel, and very much the concept of Big Brother. So they were trying to raise awareness about privacy issues for their patrons, just kind of had a whole series of activities. And I really like their, their advertising uh, that they've, they've put up. It doesn't look like your traditional library advertising. And then San Jose Public Library, uh, they have a really cool tool, if you've not gone to look at it, the, the Virtual Privacy Lab. Uh, so when you go through the Virtual Privacy Lab, you can select from a list of um, different privacy topics that interest you. So you can generate your own custom privacy toolkit. Uh, so it can teach you about those various concepts and things that you can do to improve your own personal privacy, you know, the way you handle your information online. I also really like linking to the Virtual Privacy Lab because on that page, San Jose Public Library has linked to their very nice privacy policy. And it's their general policy. It's not just about the library website, about how they handle all of their patron information. And they also, I think very interestingly, have linked to their vendor privacy policies. So all of these third party vendors they work with, they link to the privacy policies for those companies as well, which is a step that a lot of libraries don't take. I'm sure there are a lot of third-party vendors that are in use. And then there are some libraries, um, Chicago Public Library, Vancouver Public Library, New York Public Library. Many of the larger library systems um, have hosted what's called a crypto party. So crypto party is uh, it's a decentralized movement uh, trying to um, you know, raise awareness and teach people how to protect themselves in digital spaces. So a lot of nonprofit organizations have hosted it. Uh, the general website is linked there to try to find events that are probably not happening right now, but hopefully will happen in person in the future. Um, so that website provides tools to help teach people about um, you know, encrypted communications and you know, trying to prevent being tracked, things like that. Now, some libraries, if they're looking for bonus points in the name of privacy, have really taken a huge step in hosting what's called a, a Tor server. Um, so Tor is a particular browser uh, that's used, um, that uses what's called onion routing, so that um, it basically sends your information through so many different serv servers that it's much more difficult to track. And so there are servers hosted all around the world. There are all these different nodes on that particular network. Uh, so 
the library in Lebanon, New, New Hampshire, uh, Kilton Library, actually is, you know, hosts a Tor server. And the FBI visited the library and basically said, we would like you to stop doing this because, you know, Tor can be used by criminals. But, you know, there are lots of people for legitimate reasons who don't want to be trapped or just privacy oriented and they use the Tor browser. So the library basically said, we hear you, but you can't stop us and we're going to continue doing what we want to do. There's nothing illegal about what we're doing. So bye, FBI. Um, honestly, I thought that was, you know, a uh, pretty spectacular move. I, I really like the idea of librarians standing up to the FBI. <laughs> and of course, the American Library Association, through their Choose Privacy Every Day website, uh, they have lots of resources and tools and news about privacy. Uh, so Choose Privacy Week is held every May, uh, the first week of May, uh, May 1st through 7th. Uh, so it might be that this year, since we've talked a bit about privacy, maybe you'll post more about it on your social media, maybe you'll have a virtual program, or maybe at some point when we're able to get back to our libraries physically and start having programming in person again, you know, maybe it's something to think about uh, trying to, you know, teach patrons more about how to use websites safely. Um, you know, I certainly hope that at least that might inform some programming in the future, but if you're looking for tools, there's so much linked on that website. I definitely recommend you check it out. And then there are a lot of different projects that are being funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. IMLS you know, provides funding to KDLA for many things like this particular training. You know, Oh, and there's my kitty cat. I don't know if you heard Gus Gus. He woke up from his nap and now he wants attention. Uh, so they've um, funded several different projects. There's one about uh, trying to help families uh, use the internet more safely because in many situations for lower income families, um, you, the children might be more internet savvy than their parents. So talking about ways to deal with that particular community to try to, you know, I guess raise their, their ability to, you know, react safely on the internet. And, you know, if there's a data breach, it tends to impact people uh, of lower socioeconomic status more severely. So how can you help people recover from that? Um, then you've got the Library Pr Freedom Project, the Data Privacy Project, lots more to explore. I'm going quickly because obviously we're running short on time. So just a very brief moment of reflection, just a minute or two, or really something to think about once the webinar stops. You know, I would not like to like folks to think about what you might do either in your personal life um, or maybe something that can be done in the next six months for your library to try to promote better you know privacy practices so um, for example I'll let I'll go ahead and share while you're thinking about things um, I decided uh, last fall uh, to delete Facebook because I was so tired of reading all these these news articles about the various ways that Facebook was abusing my information and apologizing for it after the fact and I just kind of said enough is enough so I hit the delete button and I have not gone back uh, so you know that was one very tiny thing I've done I still continue to use Google have not extricated myself from Gmail um, but you know you, if you have something in mind you can go ahead and type that into the chat but it might just be something that you can reflect on on your own time since we are running very short on webinar time. And then just to wrap up, but we want to keep the conversation going, uh, the big takeaway, uh, I think, is that just because we can um, buy certain services to provide to our patrons, just because we've always done something a certain way, or it's easier to do something a certain way, uh, you know, doesn't mean that's what we should be doing. You know, we took a look at you know, our code of ethics at the Library Bill of Rights, and it's pretty clear about the kind of stance that, you know, librarians as a group should be taking, and it seems like we've kind of stepped away from that because we love some of those digital services that are so easy to use, even if those companies weren't founded on the same principles that libraries were founded on. So that would be kind of my big takeaway. Is let's think about whether we should be doing this. Got a few links to some more privacy uh, resources. One I didn't really talk about, but a group I really like is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They have lots of great articles, tools. Their Privacy Badger uh, extension for, for Firefox is amazing. It also works for Chrome. 
If you're not already a member of the Kentucky Tech Listserv for uh, public library staff who work with technology, uh, maybe you teach computer classes, maybe you're the IT coordinator, uh, or you just have an interest in it, you know, please sign up. You can contact me directly, or there's an email you can uh, send a blank message to to subscribe. Um, pretty soon, in the next uh, couple days, we will have the archive recording of this presentation posted to the KDLA archive webinars page. And we have many other archive webinars, so you may want to take a look, especially if you're working on getting your CE credit finished when you're having to uh, work from home. And then a big thank you to the Institute of Museum and Library Services for providing funding to KDLA. That's how a lot of our training is provided, is through their funding. So, so bless you, IMLS. And then at last, we get to my contact information. I also have a link to the survey. You'll receive that via email as well. And I've brought up the files pod, so you can download the full page slides that have working links, or you can download the handout version that has two slides per page, easier to, to print. Uh, so if you have any additional questions or comments, uh, we'll hang out here for a moment, but uh, we can go ahead and stop the recording. So thank you very much for your time.